Well, thank you very much, everybody. Welcome to the last session. Uh, it's been a great conference so far. This session is called the Public Policy Roundtable, but it is really open to all of the speakers and to give everybody who's participated a chance to speak to everybody. Uh, we would have all the presenters up, but we've only got so much space. Uh, so please don't feel limited just to ask questions to the people here. Uh, I'd also like to uh, give a shout out to the people who are watching online. Uh, if you do have any questions, please feel free to tweet them with the hashtag uh, BISP2015 and uh, we will make sure they get asked as well. So if you have questions for anybody or anything that's come out of this conference, please start formulating them and feel free to come up to one of the microphones. Uh, in the interim, I guess, as the moderator, I'll start, um, which is uh, my first question, which is to everybody, and please feel free to answer if you feel comfortable including other people here. Um, <clears throat> we've heard a lot of different issues come up during this conference. Uh, it seems to me there's a unifying paradigm, the modern money paradigm we've been talking about, but a lot of different issues about public finance, about financial regulation, about financial system design in general and the financial power, uh, but also about the real economy, looking at unemployment and the labor, uh, the labor market or the labor system, and also about investment in infrastructure in a sustainable uh, map. So given that this is a public policy roundtable, the first question that I'd like to pose to, to the panel and to everybody else is, uh, is, there a, is there a priority list? How do all these things you know, fit together? Because this, the concern seems to be, to me at least, it's diffuse, right? Because it's a paradigm for reconceptualizing everything, you have to reconceptualize everything. So it's a big challenge. And how does that, how does that work when, when we're still you know, a, a young or small movement that's grown? How do you see that challenge being overcome? Go for it. Well, I, I think the, the, the first thing we had to work on, and really this was the first thing we worked on, was uh, affordability. Mm. Because you really can't do much of anything unless you understand what is affordable, okay? And in what sense things are affordable. So uh, the starting point is that a sovereign government that issues its own currency can't run out of its own currency. So if there are things for sale, for sale in its currency, it can afford to buy them or hire them in the case of labor resources. And, um, then that changes the way you view a lot of topics, like unemployment, like social security, mm. like public infrastructure investment. So you know that you can afford these things. Then the question is, do you know how to do it? Okay. So, uh, you know, do we know how to colonize Mars? Maybe not. <laughs> Second is, do we have the resources to do it? Uh, and then the, the third is to, you know, operationalize it. I mean, I guess I, one, one sort of add-on I would I put in there is, I mean, a lot of, um, it seems like a lot of the significance of the new thinking uh, about money is precisely that it's enabling us to kind of free ourselves of the budget constraint problem, right? Um, but the next stage, as you suggest, then is to say, all right, well, what's on the shopping list, so to speak, now that we found out that we have more money than we thought we had or that, you know, we can afford it. Um, and my impression is that a lot of people are only just beginning to, you know, sort of put that shopping list together. And it might be sort of the next stage is to start prioritizing or start coming up with a sort of a shopping list. But certainly up toward the top, I would think, would be infrastructure renewal, given that the American Society of Civil Engineers has been giving us a C minus or D grade for the last 15 to 20 years now, right? It just seems to be getting worse and worse and worse by the, by the minute. So that's surely up somewhere up toward the, the top. Um, a personal sort of bugbear of my own is that, you know, it might be helpful down the road to start encouraging more ownership of firms by people who are working with them. and. One way that that's done, of course, is through the so-called levered ESOP plan, but basically you borrow, the, the, the employees actually borrow in order to buy the firm, 
And borrowing might become somewhat easier, right, once we have figured out that a sovereign currency is indeed sort of indefinitely extensible. Um, so it might become more affordable actually to become more encouraging of more uh, employee buyouts of their, of their firms. I don't know if that's really would be considered by the whole nation to be a, a public policy priority, but in my view at least it seems to be pretty important if, if we can sort of gradually move more in the direction of a society of people who kind of own the, the means of production that they're using to produce and not simply wait to be hired by those who own the means of production, whether it be public uh, entities or, or private, that might be a, a salutary development. Yeah, just on that, and I'll ask Pablo to step in in a second. I was at a <clears throat> conference a few weeks ago with uh, Stephanie Kelton, who, and uh, one of the people also at the conference was Gar Alperovitz, who is yeah. very uh, prolific on writing about workers' cooperatives. And um, mm -hmm. that was a very, very interesting and fruitful conversation. He seemed quite excited about the uh, potential for synthesis there, but I just want to maybe bring in Pavlina on that because I know that she's been developing a model for the job guarantee that could tie into, in addition to making it easy to finance the purchasing of, of, of new uh, cooperatively owned enterprises also to yeah. uh, actually just pay for the labor itself. Yeah, I mean, we, we have multiple challenges. The first challenge, of course, is the, this mantra that we cannot afford it. Um, and uh, that is you know, it's incumbent on us to reframe what it means to afford something. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, talking about sovereign currency and the government can always pay for uh, things in its own currency, I think that that is somewhat um, actually obvious if you, if you pause for a moment. There is a huge political sort of resistance to talk about it in these terms, but most, for most people it's quite obvious that the government issues its own currency. Um, so then the question is about affordability. What, do we, what can we afford to do and what can we afford not to do? Can we really afford to have an economy that, that maintains people in unemployment permanently? Can we afford to have production processes that destroy the environment? Can we afford, so we really need to, um, we need to reframe the conversation and you know, I kind of liked, um, Maybe the way Bernie was doing it, Bernie Sanders was doing it. And we have many deficits. We have deficit in infrastructure, deficit in jobs, deficits in income, deficits in, uh, you know, in the communities. Why is the deficit, the federal government deficit, somehow more important than all of these deficits? So I think that you know, um, uh, we just have to have a multi-pronged strategy. You, know, you can't just always insist that people understand sovereign money to find the merits of doing a you know, a full employment program. I, I find it a precondition to put in place a permanent program because if somebody doesn't understand the financing, they will always find a reason later down the line to say, well, this was all well and good, we did it, it worked, but now we've run out of money and we have these other priorities. So, so for me, it's most definitely a precondition to putting in place policies that are important that will be long-standing. Because we know that whenever there is the political will to do something, we just do it. And we never ask the question, do we have money to fight a war or you know, bail out the financial sector? But we always think of these policies as one-off, stopgap measures, um, you know, crisis interventions. Um, but what we're doing here is we're rethinking the footing on which our economy is built. We're rethinking the, 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 the permanent role of um, of the, you know, the public purpose, of how we permanently address the public purpose. So, you know, you know, I, I, you know I find un unemployment to be a special problem, so we need to have a permanent solution to the special problem. But to talk about preventative, long-term, permanent programs, we need to find the merits in those, on their, the real merits, and then we need to explain that the financing is going to be there. I think you go where people are hurting the most. I think you jump into the crisis situations. You bring the toolbox of analysis that we have. You bring the tools that we're learning uh, in terms of creating a regenerative economy using thousands year old principles of working with natural forces, not against them. And you demonstrate even in the most dire situations like Greece running through the Great Depression or like California, which is turning into a desert and produces a third of the agriculture for the United States. You can take these things, apply them, show results, and then you begin to build momentum. Mm -hmm. I'm skeptical about doing anything at the national level at this point. I think that conversation is just kind of stuck, but we can continue to present the points of view that we do against that stranglehold that they have, but we've got to deliver results. 
And it's the results um, for people that are in the most dire situations that will make the biggest splash. CNN will cover that, right? Yeah. That's how we mainstream this stuff. Right now we're still kind of talking to the, the converted already, but the conversion's gotten a lot bigger than many of us ever imagined it could be. But we've got to mainstream the stuff. It's not just fringy academic or legal theory, okay? We've got to show practical results. We've got to walk into the hellfires. We've got to show that we can make a difference. Um, just, yeah, um, I have a, <coughs> a professor of mine used to say, all you need to start a revolution is proof of concept and running code, right? So it's interesting uh, what Pavlina is talking about. We had a seminar at Columbia with um, Pavlina and Phil Harvey, who's a law professor at Rutgers, and there was an interesting dialogue, and this is, it's available online, uh, an interesting dialogue about the extent to which the job guarantee needs to be tied to the federal level versus maybe you can make a case for it at the state level, or even saying that it pays for itself if you have to, to make that case just so that we have a working model. But please. Um, one of the problems with the patent system is that it stunts innovation and it creates monopolies. So I was wondering if uh, the panelists could weigh in on um, their views regarding intellectual property. Thank you. One quick thought on this. Um, there's, it seems to me that you can draw an analogy, actually, between uh, the patent system on the one hand uh, and the financial system on the other in the following sense. So the classic argument that's always given um, for this or that austerity measure or this or that uh, regulatory relaxation is that those who supply the capital are going to be frightened away, right? Capital, again, is scarce and it's privately supplied. So you've really got to meet certain conditions that these people who are supplying the capital are going to impose. And in effect, what that is saying is that these rentiers are indeed renting something to you, right? And that they charge a certain rent. And if you're not prepared to pay the rent, you don't have the use of the capital. That turns out to be incorrect, right? And this is exactly why Keynes called for the euthanasia of the rentier, and there's some other wonderful quotes of his to the effect that you don't really need these people anymore, and that means you don't really have to meet their conditions. The analogy in the case of the patent system and the intellectual property system more broadly, it seems to me, is that essentially the very same argument is made on behalf of it, and it's wrong for an analogous reason, right? So the argument that's always given is that, oh, these people aren't going to invent all these fabulously wonderful things unless you give them a monopoly, a monopoly status with respect to this, or enable them to derive monopoly rents ad infinitum indefinitely, forever, right? And I just think that's crap, right? It's just nonsense. I mean, there are a lot of reasons that people invent things, and I suspect that almost no inventor, when inventing something great, is thinking, wow, if I invent this thing, I'll have a monopoly rent in, in perpetuity, and my, my great, great, great grandchildren will be able to continue with this monopoly rent. I don't think that's why they do it. I think people do it partly because some people actually are other regarding and actually think it might improve the world. Others who are less other regarding think, well, there's going to be glory that comes with this. I'm going to be the Tom, I'm going to be known as Thomas Edison. There's going to be History Channel programs about me a hundred years from now or something. There are all sorts of reasons that people do this stuff. So my guess is that if you were to extend the monopoly rent that is a patent for a mere, say, five years, or maybe give them a 75% stake in anything, you know, for some shorter period of time, that would be a gracious plenty. Even that might be more than is necessary. But in, eff in effect, this is another case where you've got rentiers who you don't really have to recognize the status of as, as rentiers. We're sort of reinventing the commons here, too. Mm -hmm. In the mm -hmm. old days, we had a commons, people grazed on it. There's the so-called tragedy of the commons. Well, that only occurs when you have people that are only self-regarding. Yeah. They don't feel like they've got any commitment to the larger community, yeah. and you're eroding those social ties because money's starting to take over all social relationships. And so uh, I think there's an argument to be made for getting innovative around common resource management tools. In Bali, they manage the whole watershed, one village all the way up to the top of the mountain. Uh, they have long-standing, semi-democratic relationships between each of those villages to do that. Um, we're going to have to rethink those because some of these things are common cultural heritage that we do want to see developed. Tesla's open-sourced a lot of their um, technology. Well, there's a reason, selfish reason why they're doing that. They want people to develop it and take it to the next level so they have that, uh, that whole brand and they have that whole area to themselves. But you can see we're kind of going from the mentality of everything has to be owned by somebody or else it's not going to be appropriately valued and efficiently allocated and used to, you know what, for thousands of years human history had common property. We knew how to manage it. 
there's still some cultures that do. What can we learn from them and innovate in terms of managing common resources that may be intellectual capital or other forms of, of uh, intangible capital? So just on that, um, one name that probably be worth mentioning is Eleanor Odstrom, yeah, who exactly. was the only woman to ever get a Swedish banking prize, uh, and, and that was on commons management. Yes. Um, and I actually did my master's thesis on, on the intellectual property and the, and the MMT view together, and uh, I was looking particularly at copyright, but both both copyright and patent in the US Constitution, at least, it, it are framed under utilitarian terms. It's designed to promote the progress of the arts and useful sciences. Mm -hmm. And if it's not doing that, or if there's a better way to do that, the justification falls away. Although today, if you ask most people, they wouldn't frame it in utilitarian terms. They frame it in moral ownership terms. I made it. It's mine. I own it. Right? So there is a, there is a, there's a profound cultural shift that, that seems to me to need to happen, but when you can um, when you can invest, a lot of artists and, and, and inventors, I think like Bob was saying, don't do it necessarily just for profit. I certainly, I was a music teacher and I know a lot of musicians and they just want to not stop and make music. You know, we don't ask where the electrons that flow around a, a copper wire come from when you spin the wire, you, you, they just flow, right? So human creativity comes naturally out of the desire to interact with people and to make things. So I, it seems to me that once you remove the monetary spec from people's eyes, you can start having a very different conversation about um, about intellectual property, at least, because unlike other commons, when you take from intellectual property commons, you're not taking away from anybody else. Mm -hmm. So one of my law professors, the same person who was talking about free software, says the great moral question of the 21st century is when you can press a button and give everybody access to all culture, all information, all art, all science, at the cost of, to produce the first uh, version of it, how is it ever moral to exclude anybody? Mm -hmm. right? And what the modern money shows is you can afford it. <laughs> the answer is, well, if we're going to run out of money, maybe we have to do this thing in the interim. But we, we don't. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Please, please be. Um, so we talked a lot about um, full employment. Um, and then one of the talks kind of estimated the cost of how this could be funded um, and then just suggested some implementation strategies. Um, and so my question would be that if we assume that employment isn't the solution for many different groups, it's part but maybe not complete, um, and we can see this from the profound wealth gap, not just profound income gaps um, between women and different um, racial groups. So what additional mechanics um, could be added to the full employment strategy or what supplemental programs would need to be in place. Um, and then I had a second question as well. Um, so we had talked about the, you know, the ideal way would be to have the federal government jump in and support these efforts, but that there's this extreme lack of political will at the point at this moment in the federal level. And so someone had suggested the idea of public-private partnerships for launching some of these things as demonstration projects at the local level. Um, and then I would ask, um, since the ideal and aspiration would be this public sphere that would support this, how would we handle those demonstration projects that are public-private in such a way that the value of the public is not pushed aside and we don't end up contributing to this privatization of the public and the devolution um, to the private of public um, roles and responsibilities? Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, on the types of programs that uh, we envision uh, would be necessary. We don't. We don't argue that the job guarantee is a panacea for all social ills. You know, we we just consider it to be an essential part of the um, safety net and the way uh, the government stabilizes the economy. We consider it to be a better macroeconomic stabilizer. But clearly, um, it's a voluntary program, and there are very many reasons why certain people will not be working, cannot be working, should not be working. Um, so. Um, Income support of various kinds would be necessary to complement the social safety net. So, you know, I favor a universal child allowance. This is a, you know, common sense program. Um, and just by adding the job guarantee at a living wage with a universal child allowance, you're going to wipe out the vast majority of, of poverty. Strengthening social security rather than rating it, or rather than reducing, you know, um, a retirement income. Uh, strengthening social security would be another uh, policy. Um, people who are unable to work, you know, strengthening Medicare, Medicaid, um, other socializing other um, expenses like those for education, for transportation, like that is all part of income, income support program. 
So, you know, having free education essentially mm -hmm. is, is another way of providing income support so that people who are not ready to go into the labor market, do not wish to go in the labor market, um, and would like to pursue education can do this without the onerous debt burden. So I think that, you know, a, a good combination of income and employment support is kind of the safety net that I, I would like to see. Can I uh, say something about the second question? So, you know, it, it's sort of easy to get very discouraged about the, the place we find the federal government and our elected representatives. Um, but on the other hand, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, mm -hmm. a lot of people know that there's something wrong, mm -hmm. especially with the financial system, mm -hmm. okay? And so we've had this outpouring of uh, a variety of proposals. So debt-free money is one. Positive money is another. Uh, nationalizing the Fed is another. Greenbacks is another. So a wide variety of things um, are being proposed by a wide variety of groups, and it's global. Uh, it's, some of these groups are actually being more successful in the UK than they are in the United States. Um, so I think that there is some pressure coming from the recognition that there's something wrong with money, maybe there's something wrong with the, uh, the way we view federal government spending and financing that spending, and maybe actually the way that we do the spending. And there's something wrong with uh, Wall Street and bailing out the, the banks who have gone back to doing virtually exactly what they were doing before the crisis, uh, maybe a little more focused on um, student loan debt, credit card debt, instead of housing debt so far. But eventually they're going to get back to the um, mortgage-backed securities. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, the good news is we're going to crash again, and probably soon. <laughs> okay? So, the second time around, <laughs> uh, people already are upset, and they're going to be even more upset when it crashes and they lose another uh, five trillion of wealth and uh, you know, 12, 000, 12 million jobs, they're gonna be very upset. I don't believe that the next bailout is gonna look like the last one. I think that uh, people are going to demand something different. And so the, the opportunities are going to, to come. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'd echo Randy here, too. I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, and, and just to give a little sort of recent history perspective, I mean, I've been sort of obsessed with unjust inequalities since I was a student, and it was inequality and its moral significance has figured into a lot of the stuff I did as a student and then what I've done since then. Um, and for years, uh, as when I was a student and when I was a new uh, academic, I was told, well, you really can't go anywhere with that because you're going to be accused of engaging in or fomenting class warfare. And I would always say, well, why is it that the defenders are the ones who are accused of the class warfare, you know, rather than the, the original aggressors, right? The ones. But, but it just it didn't, didn't matter. People would say, well, you know, good luck with that. And the first stuff that I published as a, as a legal academic was on inequality and how to determine which inequalities are eth actually ethically problematic and which ones are ethically permissible. You know, basically how to theorize justice. And, you know, I loved that stuff, and I loved doing that stuff, but hell, if anybody downloaded any of it off of SSRN, nobody gave a, a flying, you know, fudge. And so, um, you know, but then all of a sudden, um, what, and, and, you know, I was just one little person, right, but there were a couple of other guys who were arguably more important. There was a guy named Piketty, and there was a guy named Saez who were, you know, publishing all these papers, right, in the late 90s and early 2000s, and again, almost nobody paid any attention to them, at least nobody in the public. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, in 2011, right, 
I, I was working at the New York Fed at the time, half of every week, teaching the first half at Cornell, then working at the New York Fed second half. I was walking up wall over to my little New York Fed office, and there were like three guys banging on these tin pans. And I thought, well, what are they doing? And I, they said they were saying they're going to be occupying Wall Street. And I thought, well, that's kind of intriguing. And a lot of people were laughing at them, all these kind of, you know, uh, these investment banker types who are walking up and down wall early in the morning were kind of, you know, snorting at these people and laughing at them. And I was kind of intrigued. And then, you know, the following day, their numbers are, you know, it's like three times or four times larger. And then before long, they had to move over to Zuccotti Park. And, of course, Randy was over there. Um, I was there every evening after my Fed job, which was quite a riot, right? You know, I'm leaving the Fed, I'm dressed in a suit, but I would actually camp out in the evenings over at Zuccotti, trying to sort of figure out what's going on here. And it was really clear that these guys had tapped into something, that all of a sudden, and you, you all noticed, no doubt, it became respectable overnight to talk about inequality. And then what happens last year, right, the runaway bestseller is by that obscure Piketty guy, a total rock star, just because he writes a book about inequality. So I think that the times really have changed, and largely for the reasons Randy was mentioning, and I'm as, as optimistic slash pessimistic as he is about where things are going, I suspect the next crisis is coming soon, and the reaction next time is going to be much more, I think, um, memorable um, and enduring, and I think it's, it's going to be we're not going to go back to business as usual. Relatedly, who ever would have guessed in a million years, I, I swear to God, three months ago when um, I would have told you that, oh, Bernie is going to be a nice fringe candidate, and at least he'll pull Hillary at least a little over toward the left. I actually now am convinced he's going to win. Now, you might think I'm crazy for that, but I actually do think he's going to win. I think he's going to win the nomination, and I think he could very well win the presidency. Um, and I, again, th for three months ago, I myself wouldn't have said that, right? I would have, I, I just would have thought, I'm glad he's doing it, but he probably won't win. But now I actually think he'll win. And who would have guessed that Donald Trump would become, you know, <laughs> would, would hasten the destruction of the Republican Party, which we knew was going to happen anyway, on demographic grounds, if no other grounds. But it was, it was clearly engaged in a, in a long-term protracted suicide, the, the, the Republican Party, but Donald Trump has accelerated the suicide of the Republican Party, and it's going to be gone in about six bloody months. It's gone. And so that's changing everything, right? And so I wouldn't discount the, the capacity to get some real change, even at the federal level, uh, as readily as some people are. Now, again, I'm, 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 I'm probably metabolically optimistic, um, but I mean, even I am more optimistic now than I was as recently as three or four months ago. So I, I wouldn't discount that at all. I think we ought to be pushing for real fundamental change because I think it's more possible now than it's been since the New Deal. And it's probably even more possible now in some ways than it was during the New Deal era. People forget how hard, how hard won the New Deal itself was politically and legally. Hey, uh, and on best-selling books, who would have thought Graver's book? Yeah, yeah, the, the history of debt. Yeah. Was another bestseller. Yeah, huge bestseller. People are still talking about yeah. it. Just on the inequality, one other thing we're trying to do is recapture the financial system, retrain it to what its original purpose supposedly was, which is financing productive activity, and building local ecosystems of finance that can support local businesses that are regenerative economy oriented. So we've got things like crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, right? democratizing finance, putting it into entrepreneurial activity. Uh, and I'm not trying to glorify entrepreneurship, that can be a source of inequality as well, but to the extent that the main task of finance these days in corporate America is to issue debt so corporate titans can repurchase stocks, drive up their share prices, drive up their earnings per share, artificially inflate their results, right? This is totally fraudulent what we're doing here. And create a Ponzi scheme essentially because th there'll be a Minsky moment out of this. There's no income streams being generated off of that, that uh, debt build up on the corporate side. To the extent that we can do things like credit unions, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, direct public offerings are now occurring that democratize the issuance of equity. Um, this changes the whole nature of the game and maybe allows more people to bootstrap their way up or at least to rebuild local economies that have been hollowed out by Walmart and McDonald's and all the rest of it, which we're now pretty much sick of and done with, right? By the way, a quick clue. Um, so Graeber and Piketty, who nobody was paying attention to until relatively recently, I suspect the next one might be Bill Lazonic uh, the, on, on the share buybacks, right? I bet everybody will know his name at some point very soon. But at the moment, he's still kind of regrettably obscure. But look him up, William Lazonic, um, all sorts of great stuff on share buybacks. 
And, and in, 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 in the UK, at least, Mariana Mazzucato, who Brandy was talking about last night, is already a bit of a rock star. She just yeah. got appointed to Jeremy Corbyn's advisory panel, but uh, I think her name is certainly still on the rise. Definitely. Um, yeah. If I can add just a few things, we had an event just recently as part of our Money Network, uh, Modern Money Network, on crowdsourcing machines, and one of the things that we looked at was participatory budgeting. So it, at the local level in New York, they have about $20 million of the New York City budget where they have a thing that looks like a ballot, but instead of people's faces, there are projects mm -hmm. with rough amounts of those projects and people vote on how they want. So there's a way to take the, the public financing and, and, and tie it to uh, democratic participation. Uh, there's also, with, with what Rob was talking about, uh, a number of lawyers going back decades, but perhaps most uh, popularly recently is um, Larry Lessig talks about voting vouchers as a way to deal with campaign finance. So rather than trying to, uh, you know, turn back the clock on a lot of the, the you know, um, uh, Sorry, the uh, Supreme Court case, I'm, I'm blanking. Uh, Citizens United. Uh, instead, using the power of money and saying more, mo big mo more money can beat big money. Bigger money can beat big money, and public has the biggest purse of all. So the model is to give people 100 or or $200, and any candidate that accepts that money can't accept super pay. And then you do that, and then you also leverage that money. So you leverage it six to one with the public. So you're, you're, you can democratise campaign finance using modern money principles, or even without modern money principles if you want to. And similarly, people, uh, Dean Baker has proposed this with um, copyright or copyleft. So you give everybody a certain amount of money, you, you call it promoting the capital development of the, the creative or the, the intellectual commons, and that money can be used to pay artists and people to produce creative works as long as the works are released under a copyleft licence, which means that everybody can access it you know, without, without any exclusion uh, of profit. And on the last question about infrastructure, what, what Rob was talking about with finance, we also have payments revolutions going on. We haven't talked about it here, but if you look at places like Kenya, they're not building the banking systems that you see here. You know, once upon a time, banks looked like, looked like uh, safes. They were big and safe because it was where you stored your money, right? Now banks are glass because it's all about transparency. But if you go to places like Kenya or the Philippines, uh, a bank looks like this, looks like right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a bank. This and some software is a bank. And the infrastructure costs are massively low, but also the power to democratize and to change the way that that game works as a result of that. You study um, any successful technology. revolution, and it's a matter of building parallel institutions that do the job better than the old institutions, and where people have more fun. <laughs> right. with, with, the it, with the technology of the time. With the technology of the time, not the, uh, not the basically embedded technology, which right. is rusty and, and not up to date. And, and to me, at least, modern money's big insight is that the technology of money today is different than the technology of money in the past. And that's why this time is different. Um, and yeah, go for it. To emphasize what Robert just said, one of the things that um, possibly difficult to understand is some people don't assimilate well in an academic situation. So you have to draw them in and, and at least uh, one thing that I used when I was a grad student is simulations for classes, a way of introducing them to some of the concepts. I know that Fidel has been trying to move the DVD into the community here. It'd be helpful if there was a uh, server somewhere that could serve umpteen different whatever and then multiply this o over the world. I mean, I know br like the Bristol Pound is uh, made good strides as far as the transition town kind of process in terms of currency, et cetera. But you need something like that in order to people to touch, taste, feel what it's going to be like, and then maybe put something outside that. I mean, one of, the, one of the things I first did when I got out of grad school is help start an education program at a um, cooperative down in Austin. Okay, but one of the things we provided people in the orientation it's a new narrative. And they have a history. It's been done before, so they can hold to that. There's examples out there of you know, different kinds of ag co-ops and you know, various other things. They're out there. They happen. They were real. Just that. In many ways, we also don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think what we need to do is to recapture the sense of community, to recapture the sense of public purpose, what the policy priorities are. And you know, all of these movements on the ground are very encouraging because they will be the preconditions for, for, for the change when the change comes. And I'm, I'm a little less um, skeptical than Rob is that um, change at the national level 
cannot happen and will not happen because we we invented the New Deal model. You know, it was a very it, it was very hard going. You know, states were very resistant, localities were very resistant to all of this. You know, so they were given money exactly, yeah. and they refused monies for for projects the way that we've seen in Florida, <laughs> money being turned away for projects. But but we already know the success of these programs. They are. I, I think we agree. I agree that we need more. Um, modern-day programs. We've had programs, well, in Argentina we've studied programs. We have um, the India program, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which is a, a, a massive program, and there are studies that are coming out that are showing the positive environmental impacts of the program, the positive impacts on women, on wage differentials, and on and on. So we actually have programs like this that we can study. It's just they're not in the purview of mainstream discussions. We have in the United States have had a very successful youth entitlement program in the 80s. Very successful where um, jobs were guaranteed to um, youth, uh, full-time jobs during the summer, part-time jobs uh, during the school year. And that program demonstrated that the problem in the inner city wasn't um, a loss of human capital. The problem was a lack of jobs and discrimination. And when the program was put in place, it actually in reduced unemployment of black youth by 30%, doubled employment, eliminated the differential between white and black uh, unemployment. But then later it was reformed from a guarantee system to a slot system, and gradually it was phased out. We have experiments that we can study that are both local, that are national. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We do need to um, rethink the modern needs, because clearly the needs of the 2000s are different from the needs of the 30s. And so in that way, we kind of have to fit the jobs to the people and the environment and the, the community needs. Um, we did have a bunch of questions from the earlier session. Maybe we should say a few things about those. And I'm, I'm starting to, like, my, my memory is fading. But there was uh, one of the questions, the first question that uh, was posed to us is, where do you see infrastructure investment in, in the job guarantee program? Um, I, I have a somewhat different view of, of this than, than um, I don't know, maybe my colleagues here. Infrastructure has to be done, right? This is not contingent on whether we have unemployment, whether we have a recession or expansion. Like the, you know, the maintenance uh, uh, and the investment in our infrastructure is not a cyclical thing. So uh, we need a commitment to that strategic policy priority, rain or shine. Um, and also, I, I don't like to see infrastructure as, um, as the kind of public works that deals with unemployment. Surely it will produce great many good jobs and uh, this multiplier effect for many uh, years to come. But we need to be thinking about an employment program that stands on the ready to provide jobs to people as needed. You know, you don't build a bridge just because you have mass unemployment or not build it just because the economy is doing, uh, doing well. So that, you know, that's, that's the question number one. There was another question about wage subsidies. It was, uh, I think the question was, you know, why not, like, you know, how do we see um, the government's participation in these public-private partnerships and subsidizing private sector employment? Um, and, you know, I, I think the answer to this question is that, again, the private sector moves to a different drum. It has profit priorities. And there are studies that indicate that private sector actually uh, replaces um, labor. It doesn't increase net new employment because of the subsidies, but actually tends to subsidize already existing employment. And so, um, again, there may be various reasons why you may want to subsidize a, a certain private sector industry, but it's not for reasons of securing full employment over the long run. You might, we may want to encourage this particular sector. Um, so that's why you know, we, we consider the job guarantee to be a superior way of, of, number one, ensuring full employment, but number two, it has the added benefit of establishing a, a, a true uh, minimum wage policy, right? a wage floor. And we know this because we've studied both in Argentina and in India. We see the impact of that, that minimum wage. People who are hired away from the program into the private sector are paid a premium over that base wage. And um, at least in the case of, of India, there was a study that was done on, again, male and female wages, and the gap, the pay gap, was narrowed as a, as a consequence of, of, um, of this program. 
there, there was another uh, one more question. I'm just you know ones that I remember on military jobs, right? That the government is already an employer because it creates all these military jobs. I, mean, I think that the answer to this question is that bank sector jobs are government jobs, right? The private sector jobs are government jobs. You know, we we have bailed out a financial sector that was in in collapse. We subsidize private sector innovations through all of the, the DARPA projects. This is the Mariana Mazzucato, um, you know, argument where the government puts in place the investment that then uh, gives rise to various uh, private sector initiatives and employment. So in many ways, this is a flawed dichotomy. You know, the private sector somehow does something here without the role of the government, where the government underwrites so much of private sector activity. And so this is sort of the final, the final uh, piece. They just need to provide jobs for everyone. Um, there were we had a space race in the 60s. Why can't we have an Earth race in this Precisely. decade? We've done public infrastructure in this country since day one. Canals, railways, highways. This was all publicly subsidized, highly, highly public uh, inve uh, investment oriented. Why can't we do it again? We have the technology. We just don't have the money. Come on, guys. This is crazy. Yeah, so, the kind of public-private franchise mode of, of financing infrastructure has been with us from day one, right? I mean, I was talking to some, some of the folk last night. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that limited liability, in the case of the American corporation, was originally a form of outsourcing of infrastructure production, right? So what we said is, look, all right, some of these capital-intensive public works projects that have to be done, the digging of canals, the building of bridges, the, putting to, the, the, the setting up of turnpikes so that farmers can sort of take their, their wares to market over on the East Coast, all of that was in a certain sense public, publicly provided even before we had a central bank and even before we had even a, a fully stable na nation state structure in place because this was all pre-Civil War. So what we did is we said, all right, look, um, if some of you people who do have private capital, some of you rentiers, will make it ready, put it, make it available for the provision of infrastructure, we'll give you limited liability in the sense that if the firms that you're financing go bankrupt, creditors of those firms won't be able to tap your private assets, but you only get that limited liability insofar as you are financing a firm that sticks within this very narrowly defined purpose, building this canal or building this bridge or what have you. And hence there used to be a lively doctrine of ultra virus. If a firm acted outside of that narrowly defined uh, task, the limited liability shield was lost. So even things, even stuff as familiar as limited liability that now is just taken for granted on the corporate law landscape was really originally part of a kind of public-private partnership arrangement pursuant to which the public was acting to kind of steer private investment into socially productive channels. We don't do that anymore, but we, there's no reason why we can't do it again. Can I just build, and I'll, I'll get to your questions right, so thank you for your patience. Um, just with regards to this military point, the other thing is there is another model in this country of a full employment program that gives you access to food and housing. Prison system. Prisons, right? <laughs> right. The difference is that the minimum wage is in the in the, in the single cents per, per hour or something, right? And that you, you face public stigma and, yeah. and no protection of, you know, against violence and, and things. And you get health care. Right. I, I worked down at the Sentencing Commission in Louisiana, which has the... Uh, you know, unenviable record of having the highest per capita incarceration rate in the world, including the Russian gulags at their height. And uh, they have a great public employment system because they pay one half of the, the community to put the other half in jail. So there's a great cops and robbers game going on, and, and everybody's fully employed. The question is, is that actually doing anything productive? Uh, the answer is probably not. Um, but I, I want to just go to this point about models because the, the DVD, the Denison Volunteer Program, is the second version oh, yeah. of that. The first version is the Buckaroo. Mm -hmm. So we're already, you know, we already made the first transition to replication once. So hopefully that replication can come quicker. And I think one of the beauties of this system is you don't have to be a macroeconomist to run it very well. It's pretty simple on the accounting. You just have to have the right access to the right community services and, and a basic program. So, a, you know, computer program. But, I, but this point about the New Deal, um, I just want to flag that Times are different. You know, the, the New Deal was important and, and the way that we got the New Deal, uh, but there were people that were excluded. There were voices and communities that weren't a part of that. Um, and when we look at international programs, one of, the, one of the questions I think is worth asking is, how does this fit with international development goals? How does this fit with, with global sovereignty? Um, and in particular, you know, how do we deal with, with promoting the, the, the lowest um, 
you know, the most oppressed people coming up from these models. And one example that I forgot to mention before, but uh, has been you know, integrated a lot with job guarantees, is a baby bonds program. And this is Sandy Darity and his uh, his research project, which is to give people a certain amount of wealth at birth, dependent on their family income, and uh, that that providing a way of capital allocation in a, in a democratic way. This is a way to get around the the sort of injustice of a lottery of birth when it comes to economic inequality. Now, obviously, the answer is, well, that's going to be hugely inflationary or things. You go, okay, well, maybe we'll just make a little bit harder for certain types of bank lending to happen or something. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. He's about to answer. He was... Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm actually answering her question from the panel earlier. But, uh, oh, Ellen, sorry. No, you go first. Are you sure? Okay. Well, since it's on the job guarantee thing, so... Um, uh, the question earlier was, you know, public infrastructure versus a job guarantee jobs um, uh, program or ELR program. Um, once you have a job guarantee program and it's decentralized, it's community based, where community organizations, NGOs select the projects based on the needs of the community, based also on the skills of the local unemployed population. So you're really doing a matching exercise, matching the skills of the community with the needs of the community, and then the funding comes from the federal government government. Once that the projects are put in place and the community realizes, well, this is actually useful stuff and this has to be mainline government program. This doesn't have to be temporary program that will end, you know, after a few months. Then in a, in a democratic society, in a participatory system, we can make that part of mainline government spending, not part of temporary, flexible, full employment buffer stock program. So those decisions can be made over time to make it into permanent programs as opposed to temporary. Um, the other question was about um, how do you force the Walmarts to, um, you know, abide by uh, higher wages, living wages. Um, the job guarantee program will do that because again, it will set a standard saying we as a society will not tolerate wages below $15 an hour, $17 an hour, whatever the community decides. Then the private sector will have to compete with that because workers will vote with their feet. They'll say, if you're not paying me a living wage, I have a guaranteed option where I can have more fun, produce something useful to society, to my local community, and I get benefits, I get educational benefits, health benefits, retirement benefits, and if you want to hire me, you better compete with that. Take this job and shove it. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, j just on that, I lived this in Australia. When I, my friends in Australia, we have a pretty decent minimum wage, and more importantly, if you live in a city like Sydney, you can work at a, a bar or a coffee shop for $18, $22, $24 an hour. So a lot of young people in Sydney, for example, not everybody, but they're a certain you know, class, are able to go to university for very cheap, do a couple of hours of university a week, work a couple of shifts, save enough to live, have rent, and go traveling to Southeast Asia every year, and they take seven, eight years to finish university because there isn't this pressure. But when I graduated high school, my old school offered me as many hours as I wanted at $15 an hour. I didn't go work for a coffee shop. I worked for my school. I was a teacher. And then I became a music teacher officially afterwards. And that was because that was available to me. And when I graduated from law school, my law school had a fellowship program where they said, here's a check for a year's worth of salary if you can find an employer willing to hire you. And you know what? There were quite a few who were willing to hire people when it turns out you don't have to pay them anything. <laughs> so the models exist. I, I lived it twice, right? Professional and unprofessional, or skilled and unskilled, if you want to say it. And I started off doing photocopying and administrative, you know, whatever needed to be done. And by the end of the two years when I was at a school, I was saying, hey, this needs to be done. Can I do that? Yeah, sure. Another way you can think of this, I mean, you know, the interest, the reason that the Fed targets the interest rate is it's a systemically significant price, right? A systemically important price. Uh, and so we treat it as a policy variable and we act on it. Is not the prevailing wage rate also a systemically significant price? And if it is, then why shouldn't we target that as a policy variable as well? And then the LR program can be looked at as a kind of open labor market operation that is targeting a particularly important price, namely the prevailing wage rate in terms of which many other prices are determined. Ellen? Well, I have a, had a question and something else, but I, I was just going to say first, I actually went to Berkeley for free in the 1960s. Mm. California had free education. And it was a under, great system. Under Jer, um, Jerry Brown's father, yeah. Um, so my question was, 
I, I just saw an email that was from D Daily Reckoning, and it was making fun of uh, or criticizing the Jeremy Corbyn, Richard Murphy, People's QE, and said, well, there's nothing new about this. It's, you know, it's the old free lunch, and of course, it'll create hyperinflation. But I think that's the thing. Everybody knows that or thinks that the government issues the money, but they think that we can't let them issue the money because it'll be hyperinflationary. So, so there's that hurdle to overcome. But then I heard Scott say last night that there was nothing new about it because it was basically, I just wanted to have you clarify what, what you were saying, that it's basically how we fund. Uh, yeah, OK. No, I wasn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, I was kind of feeling like Charlie Munger up here. I was like, I have nothing to add to everything that was said. So, some people get that. That was <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, I did a I did a blog post a few weeks ago on the People's QE at, at New Economic Perspectives. Um, it's a very good cure for insomnia. If you <laughs> insomnia, that would be sarcasm again. So um, anyway. Uh, the People's QE is, it, it, the discussion about it is demonstrating how poorly people understand government finances and central bank operations because there is absolutely nothing in it that's more inflationary than any other government deficit. In fact, that's really all it is, is basically a government deficit because the, they're, they're designing this public investment bank, and, and it's not even the best way to go about doing this, but... Um, they're essentially trying to get more infrastructure. What they're doing is, instead of having the government issue bonds, they're having the government basically receive a loan from the central bank to do that. Well, what people don't understand is when the central bank, first off, well, we'll go back a few steps. When, when, the, central bank does, when the central bank does this, uh, and then the government spends, or the public, the public infrastructure bank spends, this simply creates reserves for banks Okay, that supposedly instead of instead of bonds is what's freaking everybody out, right? Um, but we already know banks don't use reserves to make loans in the first place, so it's not inflationary there. But secondly, from the neoclassical economic perspective of all these guys that want to say it's hyperinflationary, et cetera, what's going on is you are creating reserves, and you either have the interest rate fall to zero which, according to Paul Krugman, is not inflationary, or you have to pay interest on those reserves, which, according to Paul Krugman and every economist, isn't inflation. They're all wrong because it's not inflationary for a totally different reason. <laughs> but in their own paradigm, it's not inflationary. But they don't understand what's actually going on. But, OK, so if you didn't understand any of that, just basically, people's QE is just another way of running a deficit. It's going to have the exact same effect. It won't be any more inflationary than if the government just ran a deficit for that spending. Can I clarify one question about Ellen? Matt Forstead before talked about creating jobs that aren't motivated by the profit motive. But if we're talking about jobs that produce goods and services that aren't even priced, aren't even sold, but just given away, so how does that affect the, the relationship between purchasing power and you know, inflation in terms of things that can be produced for sale? So people at least have to put in the effort to work, and then you hope they're going to provide things that the community wants and uh, is able to use, which builds support for the program. But the, the response I would give to people who make these arguments is much simpler. Okay, so we've seen Japan running the big, biggest budget deficits in the world for a full generation, and they still have deflation. So it cannot be true that budget deficits automatically cause inflation, okay? Now we've had the UK and the US running huge budget deficits since, 19, since 2007. Again, no inflation, okay? All three of these countries have done QE, pumping as many reserves into the banking system as they possibly could do, and still no inflation. How much evidence do you need? You know? And they all want to cause inflation. All of our leaders are out there telling us they're going to keep doing this until we get inflation, and we still can't get inflation. But still, it seems to me that there's a difference between um, selling bonds, which in 
actually are kind of absorbing money that's already out there. I mean, if all money is created in banks... It doesn't absorb any money out there. What it does is absorb reserves that are locked up on the balance sheet of the Fed. They can't get out. That's the point. And that's why they can't be inflationary. The reserves don't stimulate anything anyway. The, the, thing, to, the thing to recognize is a reserve balance is an overnight debt of the government. Right. Which now pays interest. Which now pays interest. It is a bond. Right. Versus a T-bill, which is a three-month or a one-month or whatever. And so somehow the issuing the a one-month overnight debt is a lot more inflationary than issuing a three-month debt. And that's essentially the argument they're trying to make, which is can false. I, can I just clarify a question, though? I mean, mm -hmm. looking about the sustainable investment topic, there's a lot of yeah. different projects that could be done. If you put a trillion dollars into solar panels, right? And those solar panels were just installed. They weren't sold, they were just given away. That trillion dollars is now out there in people's pockets. And presumably, if there is jobs to be other, you know, private sector demand and things, it's going to absorb that. But that's, th those two things seem to be different, is what I'm asking. It seems to be the product of the job guarantee, unless it's sold, is not necessarily absorbing the purchasing power demand that's being created by the income that's being given for the job guarantee. Solar panels might cause a little bit of inflation in China, they're not going to cause it here. Right, but it, so that's what I'm asking: is is that the the purchasing power is is, is it going to have a is there an inflationary effect of the purchasing power, unless the goods are actually sold to to okay. suck that back so, out again? So uh, obviously, to answer this precisely is extremely complex, because first we have to estimate how many people are likely to take up the uh, offer of a job at the wage. So again, we've got to establish a wage, okay? Uh, but the, the estimates are that we're talking about probably 1% of GDP. At the same time, we're going to be reducing some kinds of government spending that are probably as inflationary, maybe more inflationary, which is that uh, we're offering uh, unemployment compensation, we are hiring police to uh, police them, then we're running prison systems and all this stuff, okay? So we're going to be reducing spending there, reducing crime and so on, okay? But let's ignore that for a second. So we've got about 1% more GDP. Could our economy possibly handle an increase <laughs> of aggregate demand of 1% of GDP without getting hyperinflation? <laughs> I mean, it's... It's a ridiculous <laughs> argument, right? Now, if we were talking about, well, we're going to hire 100 million people and we're, we're going to be ramping up aggregate demand by 30%, 40%, possibly. In which case, then the answer is, we'll have to do something to fight the inflation, which is what we did in World War II. We did rationing and we had wage and price controls. And we kept inflation down, even though we doubled GDP, okay, and had the budget deficit of 50% of GDP. We still handled the inflation from that. You can always raise taxes. <laughs> and you can raise taxes. Also, you know, if someone makes this argument, that first, uh, the inflation is too much spending, but then it's also inflation because we're giving stuff away instead of selling it, which would be increased spending. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, because a lot, of, a lot of times when people are talking about the inflationary effect of, of government spending, they're really thinking, what's my dollar worth? Like, what are these dollars in my pocket worth? So here's how you think about it. The dollar comes from the government. The dollar is a, it's a, it's, it's a monopoly issuer. So the government has the responsibility of setting a conversion rate for the dollar, of setting a price for the dollar. And that's what essentially the job guarantee does. It sets a conversion rate that $10 emitted into the economy will be worth one hour worth of labor. And so there are various sources of inflation. The economy moves in various ways. There's private source, there are you know, credit, you know, speculative sources, and foreign forces of inflation. The question is, the government itself, are they a source of inflation? And the way the government spends today is it sets some budget, and then it says to the private sector, sell me some stuff, but you set the prices, and the private sector decides to set prices. You know, if, there's, if there's deficient demand, the prices are lower. If there is you know, strong um, uh, scarce resources and strong demand, the prices might be higher, but the government does not uh, set prices. But you have another way of spending. You say, I will pay for labor at this conversion rate, 
And I will tell you exactly the, the dollars that I put into the economy, what they're going to be worth. So when the economy is, is shrinking and the government is increasing its stimulus, it's not causing inflationary forces. It's, it's spending exactly, the dollars that they're spending are worth exactly the many hours that they say the, the dollars are going to be worth. And when the economy is experiencing inflationary forces from private sources, the government sector shrinks. So the government is an anti-inflationary force. So here we are trying to answer the specific question of whether the government is a source of inflation and how do we structure spending in a way that it is anti-inflationary. All right, I'd love to actually build off of... Yeah, actually, can I just say one quick thing about the, the, the job guarantee anchor? And I, I know I love talking, I'm sorry. But the, I say to people, if you have a job guarantee, it's sort of like having a hand crank machine that anyone can use, and however much you, you crank the machine, that's how much of the real output that the dollar is valued. So, you know, if it produces one joule an hour, then your $10 is worth, at, at, at very least, one joule of energy. And then if you go and buy a, a soda for $5, you know that the soda is worth 30 minutes of your time. Right? So it's sort of, if not a real labor theory of value, it's counterfeiting essentially a labor theory of value within the context of the job guarantee. And the beauty of it, from a democratic perspective, is everybody's labor is worth the same. Whether a school child or an adult, they can all know that the, the soda is worth 30 minutes of their hand crank time. Right? Okay. I can understand okay. that. So I just, can I? Well, I just, um, so I've been so inspired today by what everybody's saying, but um, I'm not sure the first question was answered about how we get there or where the on-ramps are. And uh, I'd like to off, you know, offer up a challenge. Um, and it may not be, this may not be the right um, uh, question for the expertise that we have here. But, you know, we have Dream Team MMT here, you know, uh, and, but I think what, the story that we need is maybe not a macro uh, uh, monetary theory, but a micro or even a nano theory. Like, what's the story of the one person who gets a job and is able to earn revenue, and then inflation becomes irrelevant because when your revenue is arriving faster than your expenses, you can save and you can invest. And that mom who gets the job or the extra job can then spend money on their kids or their kids' education, which then causes a ripple effect of that education to break the cycle of poverty. And so to the extent that we could lead with that type of micro or nano story where the system that you've all described is the is the enabling infrastructure, then that can help all of us in this room and live streaming tell the story of, you know, who's that who's that person getting the job, or what are the five types of people that were getting the job, and, and which jobs need to be filled? Where are, the 20, you know, where are the 20 million jobs for the 20 million people, and what wage do they earn? And is that better than being on welfare or social security? And what gets people to switch off? So it goes after the argument of, oh, well, lazy people aren't going to work. Even if you guarantee them a job, they're just going to be lazy at their job, and what are we paying for? So it would be really helpful to personalize this in some iconic stories. Uh, and so if there's any either jobs that you're thinking of that are, the, you know, that are these job guarantee jobs, uh, this worked in Georgia in 2009. The Georgia legislature approved uh, essentially a 100% reimbursement program for companies in Georgia. They hired people, the state paid for it, it went to the budget in 2010, and then it got cut because uh, for no good reason. But there was a multiplier effect to that money as well as a human effect. And um, and so, so to the extent we can tell that micro or nano story of who is the person getting the job, which uh, presidents you know do well. This is, this is the person who's gonna benefit. And I think it can be a team of people, a team, uh, mix of individuals can benefit. The single mom, the underemployed millennial, the, you know, we can come up with those characters. And when we can fit the systems to the characters, it's always easier to tell a bottom up story of individuals than it is a top down story of system. And then we can backfill with all the uh, economics literacy and finance literacy uh, as well, because I, I don't think to get, to build the movement for the critical mass of people to be excited about it. You know, it's just like civil rights or LGBT rights. You need to know somebody. And so if you can tell that story of who you know and how their life will be changed, then uh, we can benefit from all the vision and expertise that you have here. Thanks. Eric Olson, who runs the Permaculture Skills Center up in Sebastopol, he's gone up to Grayton 
there's a day laborer center. The contractors come and they pick up the Latino, probably undocumented workers. And he's trained them how to install solar panels, how to do roof uh, rainwater catchment. And they've done it to the day laborer center. So when the contractor pulls up, he goes, what is that up on, the, up on the roof there? Did you guys do that? And they can advertise, hey, now we have the skills. So what if some of this ELR money, this job guarantee money, was involved in that training and in that supply acquisition to yeah. get those things d done? And then that becomes a story that spreads through the whole Latino community. Hey, guys, look, we can Great. do it this way. Yeah. So, yeah, so if we can make even like a top 10 list of what jobs we're filling, I think that'll help like crystallize action. That, that seems like a great idea. You just think about what kinds of campaigns have been successful over the last 30, 40 years, right? I mean, everybody remembers Reagan's welfare queen story, which was false, but the anecdote ended up getting a lot of traction, and that was everybody's conception of the welfare system after that for ages, right? And then, of course, ever since then, right, Bill Clinton runs for president in 1992, so he tells you the story of Chuck and Jane, or he says, oh, Susie over there. And then every, of course, uh, State of the Union address involves like three or four individuals who they put up there in the balconies. Exactly. And you see Frank exactly. up there, he saved his life by throwing his body onto a hand grenade, and he saved her. You know, and, and it's true. That's, that's, that's what seems to work. And so I think that's the point is really well taken, that it's important for us to be able to kind of reduce this to a few sort of hypothetical anecdotes, for example. I think it also dovetails with the model observation, right? And, um, and so again, I'm going to add my voice to Rowan's and shouting out about Faudel's course and about the, the way it's done over at UMKC as well. If people can actually experience this stuff tactily, then they can actually appreciate it more. But I think your anecdote story, too, about actually in, uh, envisaging individuals who benefit or even just groups of individuals who would benefit in particular ways, I think that's going to be immensely helpful. Yeah, and we all have phones, so, so we can all interview people, and then we can share it via whatever hashtag. So it just it would help to build the, um, the texture and the layer of what this means to real people. Because I think real people are primed today, like you said, about whether it's Bernie or Trump, people are primed for a change. So the more we can uh, make it specific, then the more we can implement the great ideas. Right. We need like Thanks a humans of New York for the job <laughs> guarantee, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, with the, with the youth guarantee that Pavlina's employed, one of the things about the psychology there of laziness, you know, I, when I was working in criminal justice, one of, the, one of the pillars there is when you start with youth justice, people aren't really as inclined to call young people evil and lazy criminals, right? They're, they're kids, let's give them another chance. And right now, the youth unemployment rate around the world is horrific. So, you know, if you, if you, if you can't get a universal one, but you don't want to make it local in a, in a sort of sector specific sense you could just say anyone up till 22 you know and 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 who's going to call an 18 year old lazy rather than say these people need need a chance to become part of the economy That's another strategy, by the way, well since the early 90s you might have noticed one of clinton's sort of master strokes was every time he tried to introduce some new social policy they would start it as a family thing right or for kids and then the thought was that you can gradually radiate outward from there, kind of in an incremental fashion. And, and we've talked uh, about public probably. education. I mean, one of the big problems about universities is the whole theory is geared towards an end, end result that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. You go to kindergarten so you can get into a good high school. You go to high school so you can get into a good college. You go to mm -hmm. college to get a good job, and then where's the job? It doesn't exist, right? It's a cruel fiction. It's, 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 a, it's a promise that isn't kept, and we can, we can just slot this into the end of that story and say, hey, look, here's the promise that we made. It's still about Jeremy Corbyn's uh, PQE. I mean, they, they're in England, right? So they don't pay. You said they didn't have a reserve requirement. Do they pay interest on reserves? And also, my understanding was that it was helicopter money. I mean, that it's not a loan, that they're going to print the money and hand it over to the government to spend. But maybe I'm wrong. I would suggest they have a bond sheet that would count yeah. that. We can maybe um, the bond sheet. Yeah, my, I suppose in the interest of time, my, my blog post. Does all the balance sheet, does all the balance sheet transactions yeah. and walks you through, um, and deals also with the separate issue that is freaking out a lot of people, which is the so-called central bank independence and the threat, which there isn't a threat to central bank independence from that, but or what people call central bank independence, um, right. their administrative discretion to set interest <laughs> rates on the overnight rate, right? <laughs> That's right. So anyway, we'll leave it at that. Uh, two th questions that really come out of what Robert said in the last few minutes. Uh, you talked about the family uh, jobs spreading out. What place could universal public service have in this uh, program to, 
Number one, have uh, access perhaps to a military draft, which might reduce our military incursions, access to medical training, which would help with our growing medical situation, infrastructure problems. Does universal uh, service, which is existing around the world in other countries, have a role in uh, partially building up economic action? That's yeah. the first one. <laughs> I think are maybe worth drawing out. One is that another strategic masterstroke when it comes to getting the public to accept what initially strike people as sort of radical new programs is rather than framing it as something for kids or for, you know, for the kids or for the family or whatever, oftentimes it's just, if you can frame it as a, as a national security measure, as a military thing, right? I mean, the first integration that we, the first racial integration that we had on a massive scale was done in the armed forces, right? And the first cradle of the grave sorts of insurance programs that we had were offered to service members because they, they had paid their debt or they had, you know, they had done something for us and so now we owed them, right? And, and um, you know, even uh, widespread publicly uh, supplied higher education was initially justified by reference to Sputnik, right? The Soviets sent Sputnik up in 1957. Oh, God, we don't have enough engineers. How are we going to compete with those communists who have such an inefficient system? Oh, well, maybe we should offer sort of socialized higher education, too, just like they do. We also had the GI Bill. Right, and of course the GI Bill. So, so often when it's framed in those terms, I think you can actually make it palatable when it's otherwise maybe, maybe not. Um, and so um, I think that the idea of introducing some kind of universal national service that is not just military but that you know is other takes other forms I think that's a, a great one right I mean that would it seems to me that that would be one way to make this happen because you could say all right look in return for this you're going to receive these various public benefits and now we can actually frame it as paying you back for the service that you provided that we but, conscripted but you into any, any job that is created by that also has a follow-on mm -hmm. to other jobs that uh, build around it so mm -hmm. it, it, it mm -hmm. I think could be much much bigger mm -hmm. the second thing you mentioned a while ago is the charters of corporations oh, that right. over the years were gradually eroded away to the point where it's now just make a profit and uh, I've heard a couple of times today we've got to do something about Citizens United I may tried to make the point yesterday that Citizens United is a symptom. It is not a cause. It is a symptom that was created because we had corporate personhood from 1886 and money as speech from 1976. Unless we do away with the underpinnings of the power that corporations have, which is something we can do, everything that we try to do runs into that block of corporations saying, I have first, second, no, first, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, ninth, and 14th Amendment rights as a person. You can't do that to me because it violates my constitutional rights. And the range of activities that are affected by this fact is enormous. It's sort of underlying everything else. And then we have ALEC that, that produces all the state legislation that goes against the interests of the public and for the interests of the private sector I, I, I hate to be a broken record, but I don't hear anybody going behind this of what do we do about reducing the influence of corporations. We are not going to get campaign finance reform so long as all of our legislators depend on the money they get uh, in order to be elected. They are the ones that have to vote on something like that unless we get a constitutional amendment through the people, which is what I'd like to see us do. Maybe two thoughts on that. I mean, first a narrow point and then a broader point. I mean, the, the narrow point, and this goes back to something that Rowan said as well, um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm all in favor of more public financing of elections and giving out vouchers to candidates and the like. But, you know, I'm also a little uncomfortable with, with that because I think it gives a free pass to somebody who's being ignored here, and that's these media companies, right, these broadcasters. In my view, this is another case of a public resource that people generate private rents off of. We used to have a doctrine that the airwaves belonged to the public, and all of these broadcasters who were using electromagnetic spectrum had to pay the public back for the use of that spectrum. Now, we don't make them do that any longer. We basically, in 1996, gave away those pieces of spectrum. We no longer... That's we part didn't, of the corporate person. Right, yes. And so we didn't charge them for that. 
And meanwhile, we allow them now to charge us rents to engage in the bloody self-governance project that we're supposedly engaged in as Americans, right? I mean, we have to in order to make informed decisions about who's going to be representing us, who's going to be governing in our name, and so forth. We have to hear from these people, and we have to have actual discussions and conversations among them, not sound bites. So what do we do? Instead, we say, well, you know what? We're going to basically make our, our, our sort of deliberative democracy dependent on people paying private rent to other people who are occupying what is a public resource in the first place. So first of all, I think we ought to reclaim that public resource and stop giving these broadcasting companies essentially a free ride, basically, enabling them essentially to capitalize on and earn private rents on our own government, our, I'm sorry, our own deliberative democratic process, our own self-governance project. That's the sort of narrower point. The broader point, I think it's, it's your point is very well taken. I mean, the, the, the idea of corporate per personality initially was viewed as itself an extraordinary privilege. And the idea was you have to be able to segregate firm assets on the one hand from firm constituent assets on the other hand so that we know that basically creditors of the company know that the company's assets are not going to be attachable by creditors of the constituents of the firm. Right? It was an asset segregation rationale behind this. And this was viewed as an extraordinary privilege, an extraordinary thing at the time. And again, we only provided it, only conferred it in return for these firms doing something that was considered to be a public function, namely the building of infrastructure. But at this point, we don't need them anymore for this purpose, right? In other words, capital isn't scarce in the relevant sense any longer. We don't have to come up with all of these privileges in order to get the rentiers to make their money available to build infrastructure. We can do it ourselves and we can do it directly. And so in my view, we should re-examine the entire panoply of corporate privilege including, beginning with, corporate personality itself, with a sort of asset segregation that takes the form of limited liability on the one hand and corporate personality on the other hand. Those are two sides of one coin. We should re-examine those because the entire premise on the basis of which we conferred those very extraordinary privileges in the first place is now gone. There is not a, a, a capital scarcity and we don't depend on you know, 100 rich people in the colonies of Pennsylvania and New York to provide the, the working capital that we need in order to build our own infrastructure. All of those days are completely gone. And so I think we can re-examine the whole corporate system from the ground up, including separate personality. Right. Okay, so... Last comment. If you say real, personality yeah, real quick. corporations as opposed to personhood, you are minimizing what the situation is. Well, personhood, fi I'm, fi I'm fine with using personhood, too. But I just basically... Yes, so... So we have to close up here, but I'll use my moderator privilege one last thing. Just to give a couple examples of the service point, we have AmeriCorps, we have TFA, even though it was mm -hmm. framed in a very elitist way and has had impacts on regular public service jobs that are probably not desirable. We have public service law careers where if you go into public service, they cancel your debt at the end, and they have similar things in Australia with medical programs, rural bonded medical programs to get people out into rural communities that need medical service. So these exist. We also had in, in the, in the uh, New Deal era people who were tasked with going and doing oral histories of former slaves because we recognised the cultural service that needed to be performed and the building of the cultural infrastructure. So on this point about spectrum, I mean, the free software movement has a broader agenda than just being anti patent and copyright for software. If you listen to their, uh, their rationale, they say free software, free hardware, which means your computer isn't being spied on by the government. It's yours when you have it in your pocket. Free culture, which is we wrote a paper, uh, uh, op-ed in our Morningside Muckraker at Columbia as part of the Modern Money Network called Free Culture, Free Finance. And this was making the, the connection. And also um, Free Spectrum, which goes back to this, this idea of commons management in Eleanor Nordstrom. So there is, a, there is a whole conversation around media and communications infrastructure that I think the modern money view certainly uh, enhances and supports, if not uh, if, if not necessarily directly relates to. Um, so I think we've got to close it up there. Dinner is upstairs. Um, thank you very much for everyone. I, I'm sorry, we, we, it's 6.30, we've got to go upstairs. And uh, the, the people who are the presenters, please uh, come upstairs to um, uh, do a photo before dinner. Thank you. <laughs>